Thank you. Our next speaker is Anthony Seeger. All right, now we'll try this again. Can you hear me now? Yeah. All right, well, uh, we were asked to address sort of the impact on us of these books and then the impact on the field. Uh, I need to begin this by saying that I have a grandfather named Charles Seeger, who was one of the co-founders of the Society for Ethnomusicology, but I didn't see him from the time I went away to boarding school at the age of, in 1956 until after I got back from the field in Brazil in 1973. So my ignorance has to be excused from the fact that Charles and I didn't talk for, for that whole period. Therefore, I didn't know about these books for a really long time. Um, 1964, they were published. I didn't know anything about them, and I just played the banjo and guitar and uh, spent as much of my college time as I could riding the hills of Vermont in either my motorcycle or my horse. And um, I bet you didn't think that. And, um, so I didn't know about them. 1967, the two books have been published for three years. I was studying at Harvard. I was taking classes in the social sciences and folklore. We had no assignments of readings of Karl Marx, Alan Merriam, or Bruno Nettle. Do you think they were all su too subversive, or perhaps beginning their last names with M or N was too subversive? But whatever it was, uh, even in folklore at Harvard, there was a preponderance of interest in, in texts and ballads and virtually no interest in sound. And therefore, you know, these books took a long time getting to some corners of the place. I went on to graduate school at Cornell University and the University of Chicago, where they also were not assigned. Um, fortunately, I went down to Indiana University uh, and discovered like-minded souls and um, uh, uh, discovered folklore was there which it wasn't in Chicago, and ethnomusicology was there, and I discovered the archives of traditional music, a whole lot of great musicians, man, they could play, and um, great camping uh, really close by. So I spent a fair amount of my time uh, in graduate school actually going camping down in, in Brown County and, and learning about ethnomusicology there. That's when I discovered the books. 1970, um, I was a graduate student. I've been at Chicago for two years. I still didn't know anything about ethnomusicology, right? All I had was a couple of books, and I never talked to my grandfather. Um, and Leonard Meyer, who was then chair of the Chicago Department of Music, uh, he was the author of um, uh, Emotion and Meaning in Music, he asked me if I would teach a course in ethnomusicology uh, with Ella Zonis, who was a specialist in the music of Iran. And uh, we were going to teach what was probably the first ethnomusicology course ever given at the University of Chicago, and I didn't know anything about it. These books were a lifesaver, both of them. First, uh, I admired immensely the passion of, of Alan Merriam. And I admired immensely the, the, sort of the, comp the ability to, to make a compendium of, of knowledge uh, that, that Bruno had. And above all, I admired his uh, librarian's attention to bibliography. The bibliography in Bruno Nettle's books over the decades of have for, before the internet and before online catalogs really been fundamental, I think, to the field. Whoops, I didn't turn on my timer. So, 1979, I inherited my grandfather's books. <laughs> and um, uh, one of his books was The Anthropology of Music. And I have up here his signature in it. He bought it or got it in 1965. And it, of all of the books I inherited from my grandfather, The Anthropology of Music was the most marked up. It had the most marginalia. This is sort of a summary. You don't have to look at it, but there's a lot of it there. And uh, one of the things I think is important about books is they aren't just ideas. They're also artifacts of people's interaction with them. And I think marginalia in our field have probably been underappreciated as ways to look at the past and um, to look at and to reconsider your own history as you read a book over again that you've already marked up as an undergraduate student. Uh, I don't, how do I get this to go down? Page down, maybe? Try to escape. Escape. There we go. So um, marking up books may not simply be part of the process of doing research, but one more of the products of our research, like our field notes and our recordings. 
And um, so it seemed to me that uh, my contribution to this particular one was to say, well, you know, people mark up their books, and sometimes interesting people mark up their books interestingly. This is Charles uh, sort of with various comments. Uh, one was, this is better about one thing, and wow, about another. And he says, to hell with attitude at one point. I never saw it. It was the only hell that appeared in all of his marginalia. Now, here's what he wrote on page 276 of um, the Anthropology of Music uh, at the end of a chapter. And Alan had just, Alan Merriam had just written about um, how ethnomusicologists are in a superb position to contribute to a further understanding of local aesthetics and the arts. And Charles sort of lets loose at that point. And he says, um, and I'll read these. He says first, one, uh, the notes read, but one, he's got to know the music of his own culture better than Alan P. Merriam does. <laughs> Two, he must talk the language of the people he is investigating well. Three, he must be able to make the music he is making speech about. He was writing at UCLA at that point. And four, he must be fully aware of the extent to which he is talking about talking and talking about music. And five, he must cite more first-hand data from more varied collection of cultures. Six, he must stop dichotomizing in terms of either orness. So um, that's interesting, and that actually gives us a perspective on, on how Charlie was Charles was reading this at the time, and also how the book was being received and um, and discovered. Finally, what are the book's significance today? I I agree they they redated now though I still also assign the, the anthropology of music to some people who, who could use it. Um, Bruno keeps on rethinking his history of the field, and they're absolutely brilliant, and they keep on having even better and better bibliographies and uh, more and more perspectives in them. Um, Alan didn't get a chance to do that. I was taking a course on him at Indiana University when he, when he died, when the plane crashed. I was there to study with my colleague Ruth Stone and others to learn something about ethnomusicology because I never learned about it in graduate school. So some people don't get the pleasure of learning about it in graduate school. They have to do it later. Um, they, I think we today, the anthropology of music seems dated partly because it's not only anthropology that contributes to our understanding of music. We can slice, the feel, we can slice that banana. We can take that music and approach it from many different disciplines and both make contributions to our understanding of music and to the disciplines whose approaches we are using to talk about it. Thank you very much.